Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of At War. Thank you to everyone who tuned in to our last episode about Russia's involvement in South Asia. Today, we'll be talking about climate change and its link with armed conflict. We have with us Hassan Anwar. Hassan is an experienced carbon project development professional who has worked on energy access and carbon offsetting projects across Pakistan, East Africa, and China, as well as at the United Nations Environment Programme in Geneva. He's also an Acumen Fellow and a Fulbright Scholar. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Pleasure to be here, Aisha. Thank you. Um, so to start off, I kind of wanted to ask you um, a very difficult question, which is to explain as briefly as you possibly can for our viewers, how acutely Pakistan is looking like it will be affected by climate change. We already know that Pakistan is going to be one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to climate change. Um, but, but I kind of just wanted to talk to you about the key existential anxieties that the country faces in terms of water scarcity, food security and natural disasters. And then we can move on to, you know, linking that with armed conflict. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so Aisha, firstly, there are the bare facts, right? So as you mentioned, and something that's been sort of bandied about quite a bit is Pakistan is the fifth most vulnerable country to climate change. Uh, but I think just moving on from that, you then have to look, delve, delve a bit deeper into some of the facts as well. So, you know, one of the things that comes across is that, you know, water scarcity, but the water, water scarcity issue is so acute that Pakistan is considered to be the third most um, vulnerable country in terms of water scarcity. Um, it's facing a, a issues such as by 2025, you know, Pakistan would lose up to or would, you know, would have a shortfall of 25 percent of, you know, its water demand needs. Um, and then on top of that, uh, more than 30 percent of Pakistan's energy requirements come from the hydropower sector. Consequently, with uh, changes and variations in water supply, what it would lead to is would lead to acute power outages, power shortages, given how highly Pakistan uh, depends on its hydropower sector. Then on top of that, then you also have to look at its sort of agricultural output. Um, so already we can see that with the changes in weather patterns, uh, the shortening of the growing seasons, as well as the variations, the growth cycles, we're seeing an 8 to 10 percent decrease in yields across different types of crops uh, on average. Uh, but then, you know, you have to also look at the human cost of these. So these are the bare facts. But then in terms of just making the numbers more human, you then have to look at how many um, sort of people have been left homeless, how many refugees uh Climate yeah. disasters have caused over the past two decades. And, you know, uh, different estimates put those numbers to between thirty to forty million people um, who have you know been affected in terms of losing their homes. Um, similarly, we've already seen how bad the uh, the summers have gotten in Pakistan. You know, the two thousand and fifteen um, uh, heat wave in Karachi yeah. is an acute example of that. You know, we you know some estimates put the death toll figures to up as high as four to five thousand with the official death toll of 1500 um so you know you have all of these elements coming in and then you also saw um how the flooding uh, crisis in, in swat right in the middle of the insurgency actually led to the insurgency in swat becoming far stronger and oh, get, right. getting a, a greater level of support so we can already see how these trends are are, are coming in and impacting uh, Pakistan at um, at a very high level. Um, already, uh, you know, Pakistan is losing two billion dollars worth of GDP annually uh, just because of flooding uh, risks and annual flooding issues that happen um, every year. Um, so, so these this is you know a very acute crisis that Pakistan faces, and unfortunately. In terms of mitigation, Pakistan cannot do a lot. Uh, Pakistan is not the primary driver of climate change across the world. In fact, Pakistan is, you know, uh, mm. one of the, the lowest emitters uh, per capita globally. Yeah. Uh, but then the challenge that Pakistan faces is more of adaptation because climate change is real for Pakistan. Um, it is really uh, an existential threat. But what we face a problem with is, you know, lacking the resources to adapt to the changes that are becoming quite acute. Mm. And I think it's really interesting that you've already mentioned the fact that flooding in Swat, you know, fueled the insurgency. And I, I kind of then want to go on and talk about that because I think um, that's something that we haven't talked about as much when we're looking at climate change, the effect of that on armed conflict. Um, and many academics kind of differ on the direct nature of the link between armed conflict, but most agree that it's a threat multiplier, which means that it loads the dice, really. So climate change ultimately means that all of these things are exacerbated to the point that armed conflict becomes more and more likely. Um, 
And uh, it's been pointed out that conflicts in Somalia, Yemen, and Syria um, have their roots in these really unusual and really exceptionally long droughts in those regions, which have led to civil wars. Um, so how do you think that um, conflict and insurgency are linked to eco- ecological collapse in Pakistan in particular? You've already mentioned this part. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So, so I think, you know, there are two sort of aspects to this, right? So one is obviously, you know, a more external um, aspect where, you know, Pakistan's uh, geopolitical positioning and how it relates to its, its neighbors um, and, you know, the potential for armed conflict with its neighbors. And then there's the potential for internal discord. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, so firstly, at the top, there's the rhetoric, right? I, I kind of buy into um, the story about, you know, uh, it's, um, it's a threat multiplier, uh, whereby I think, you know, during the the 2015 sort of heat wave crisis in Karachi, where you know Pakistan faced record um, temperatures, uh, temperature highs across both southern Punjab and Sindh, uh, you know the climate change minister at the time came out and said that you know it was caused by uh, you know coal based power plants in India. Oh, okay. um, similarly, yeah. uh, you know we've already seen how much more real um, issues have arisen around you know Baglehar and Kishan mm. um, and then you know as a continuation of that. Even with uh, the smog um, crisis that we faced in in Punjab, uh, you know the whether it's based in fact or more in rhetoric, yeah. we do see fingers being pointed towards India as being the main cause of you know the smog situation that ends up in in Gulf of Pakistan. So so that rhetoric then ends up becoming more and more uh, sort of grinded in, in the public's sort of perception, which ends up resulting in an even more hostile position mm-hmm. towards towards you know. Um, your border with India. But then I think what we also have to factor in is sort of the internal, um, you know, discord um, as a result of climate change. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, the water scarce, water scarcity situation in Pakistan is already quite acute. But just be- before that, uh, the, the the dispute between Punjab and Sindh is long running on, on mm-hmm. water um, water rights, given that Sindh is a, a, is a low riparian and water distribution. Oh. Um, and that's been something that's been going on for decades. Um, even the internal sort of um, IRSA mechanism that was set up to, you know, uh, allow for the equitable distribution of water between the different provinces has been marginally successful in resolving this dispute. Every year, almost every year, we see um, an issue coming up regarding, you know, how the water is being withheld by Punjab and not enough water being being sort of allocated to Sindh um, hasn't led to, to sort of uh, a fully fledged armed conflict, but it has major potential as water becomes more and more of a scarce resource right, in this yeah. basin. Um, similarly, um, you know, coming back to the SWAT sort of, you know, conflict area. So, you know, uh, one of the major reasons or drivers of, uh, you know, flooding in the region has been acute deforestation that's been taking place. Mm-hmm. Consequently, as a result, you know, economic opportunities are declining uh, sort of with time resulting in um, a greater sort of, you know, economic uh, depravity occurring across the region. So the, it, it is no, no coincidence that, um, you know, the rise of the Taliban was sort of, you know, exacerbated or coincided with the Swat floods. Um, and then the continuous stream of flooding that took place from basically 2009 to 2014 onwards. Right, there was a right. successive um, sort of, uh, you know, flooding events that took place, resulting in greater and greater losses to infrastructure uh, in the region. So, you know, in terms of the, the you know, the internal, the drivers for internal discord, all of these are, are flashpoints that could sort of, you know, flare up at any point in time as Pakistan's climate crisis uh, increases uh, over a period of time. And this is not even sort of talking about the different other issues that, um, that are occurring, uh, you know, with regards to food insecurity, whereby different provinces rely on each other to mm-hmm. provide uh, different sources of sort of food security. So Punjab, which is basically considered um, the breadbasket for yeah. Pakistan, essentially, as, you know, climate impacts are occurring on Punjab um, and its sort of agricultural output. Uh, you will continue to see more and more of, um, you know, uh, discord occurring between the distribution of food resources between provinces, which will again become a, a, a flashpoint for future conflicts. So, you know, all the, the, the situation or how to put it, the dices are loaded uh, in the sense, mm-hmm. that, you know, already in, in favor of, you know, a, a potential uh, conflict occurring between uh, interprovincial conflict occurring uh, in, the, in the very near future. Right, right. I'm quite interested in this idea as well that 
we can look at it in terms of uh, an international armed conflict, so with it, with our neighbours in terms of water scarcity. And we can also look at it in terms of an internal one, how to lit fuel a non-international armed conflict like within our borders. Um, and I also find it very interesting to look at it on a very individual level. So this whole concept of angry young men and about how... Um, these angry young men who are then deprived of their livelihoods due to climate change and resource scarcity might then be very easily recruited to fight in conflicts. And we've seen that, you know, organized armed groups like Boko Haram and the Islamic State, they allow people to join their ranks to work for food. So they're kind of profit profiting of this, they're capitalizing off the fact that you have this, these disbanded young men who are aimless, who are quite nihilistic and who have nowhere really to be and no jobs. Um, and even in 2009, ISIS recruitment efforts actually targeted impoverished farmers in Iraq um, whose livelihoods were devastated by drought. So do you think that there's a threat that we're going to see that same scenario play out in Pakistan um, where we have angry young men who are radicalized and then ripe for recruitment by these groups as their livelihoods in, are increasingly threatened by climate change? Um, I, I would think, yeah, I mean, I think there's already precedent for that that exists in Pakistan. So obviously, you know, looking at, um, you know, the agriculture, main agricultural region of Pakistan, primarily, you know, southern Punjab and northern Sindh, which are already facing an acute water shortage, uh, you know, uh, because of, you know, the, the, the advent of climate change and its impacts in these areas. Uh, you know, these, these areas are also becoming, especially South Punjab, you know, is being considered as a recruiting ground for potential uh, militancy and uh, insurgent mm. outfits. Uh, but then when I say it's already played out, I, I already look at the exact, you know, turn back to the example of Swat, which was and has been one of the most affected regions because of climate change. Um, you know, a, a lot of the weather events such as the flash flooding and the subsequent landsliding events that took place in the region uh, impacted uh, the economic outputs of mm. uh, or the impact, uh, economic opportunities for youth in the area, who then quickly sort of you know uh, got into this recruitment cycle right, for the Pakistan, right. you know, the Tehrik Taliban in the region. Mm. Uh, one of the major gripes or one of the major reasons for the support of that outfit was primarily because the you know the local population um, had a gripe with the administration, whether it's the bureaucracy or the delivery of services in the area which resulted in them looking towards a more alternative uh, source of governance in the region. Mm. Um, so I think, and then because of the lack of economic opportunities, what ended up happening was the youth of the region turned to, you know, uh, to activities such as um, uh, illegal logging of forests. So I want to link this to actually um, an event which, you know, has been a major reason for the default the, the spike in deforestation mm -hmm. across Pakistan. So, and it's it's a cycle. Uh, primarily, you know, illegal logging, uh, or especially Swad in the Malakan region, you know, was one of the highest forested regions in Pakistan, where the rate of deforestation was actually far lower compared to other regions. Mm -hmm. But because of the rise of Taliban and the you know lack of economic opportunities, the Taliban actually turned um, towards illegal logging as a source to generate revenue, right, uh, right. resulting in deforestation to, to the effect where, uh, you know, uh, over an annual deforestation of 10% was seen across these areas. Okay. So, and well. over a period of time, you know, entire hills and mountain sites were sort of, you know, completely deforested. Mm. Um, now, what this ended up doing was that this became a cycle where deforestation led to soil erosion and eventually more and more and more mm. sort of um, uh, flooding and landsliding events resulting in a an even greater uh, burden on the eco economic sort of activity in the area that led to, and that still continues to lead to a greater disenchantment with the current status quo. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. which again, you know, even though the insurgency in the region was quelled, um, but as we know, sort of, uh, it is a region where you know, the military is still sort of very active in trying to ensure mm -hmm. law and order in the area. So, you know, with the rise and the lack of economic op alternative op economic opportunities in the region, that is another flashpoint where a similar movement could rise in the future, mm -hmm. primarily because of uh, the lack of um, uh, you know, support for uh, the youth in the region. Yeah, yeah. And it's very interesting to see how like uh, illegal logging and this timber mafia then goes to driving, to, to funding an armed group. Um, which, you know, is directly responsible for like, you know, perpetuating the, a protracted kind of armed conflict and yep. it just perpetuates this same cycle of climate change leading to armed conflict. Um, I kind of, it kind of makes me think very counterintuitively whether then 
um, measures we're then putting into place for climate change, such as the billion uh, tree tsunami or um, the afforestation drives. And I think that under Pakistan, under the Paris Agreement has kind of, um, I mean, we're five years on from the Paris Agreement. And in terms of what Pakistan has done, it's largely been focusing on afforestation. Maybe mm-hmm. maybe you could shed more light yeah. on what Pakistan has been doing. Um, and the ways in which, it, is it very contradictory to be like, well, maybe afforestation drives are also playing into that same problem and that they're also leading to this in terms of you're going to have the timber mafia go after that as well. What are you doing then? You're you're directly funding these armed groups again, leading to this, again, cycle of uh, armed conflict and climate change being linked. So I think, um, and that's a very, uh, very astute observation, uh, if I may say so, uh, because Pakistan, even though, you know, the afforestation drive that's taking place, the, the building tree tsunami in KP and then the Chelmi tree tsunami, that's, you know, more of a nationwide approach to it, um, have our drives that have to be dotted uh, because I mean, yeah. I think they have trended to reverse a lot of the deforestation trends that we've seen in Pakistan. However, I do think that um, you know the approach towards, and that is, you know, that is at no fault to the Ministry of Climate Change, or you know, that is not a cause for actually uh, beating the the the, the ten billion tsunami program. But a major reason I, uh, you know, in, as far as I understand, has been uh, that the afforestation efforts have not actually also come with more. Um, of a community engagement element mm. where afforestation is taking place. But a reason that deforestation took place originally was because of a lack of economic opportunities where right, the youth right. had to turn to illegal mm. logging, which then fed into more funding mm. for um, the, the insurgents in the region. Now that deforestation is taking place, but there is still a lack of opportunity. Um, what we've seen now, um, especially in some of these areas where you know afforestation has taken place at a very high rate, is that there is still this... Um, um, this feeling of dis- disenchantment with these drives primarily mm-hmm. because they feel as if their land which could provide them alternative opportunities is now being used for afforestation oh, okay. as a government-led drive mm-hmm. which has not had adequate um, inclusion or inclusive efforts for the local communities um, even though having said that the government has tried um, you know to bring in uh, you know, or, or source uh, the raw materials for these afforestation drives from local communities having said that uh, there is not enough of a, a community engagement element, which you know leads to the fact that these drives may not be sustainable in the longer term, mm. um, given that there is not of enough of an economic element. So I do think that you know there is a case to be made for how these forestation drives, even though they are you know to be lauded in the short term, may actually lead to a perpetuation of this cycle of you know sort of violence and insurgency, perhaps right, right, right. Um, in, mm. in the longer term. Okay, very interesting. And and I'm kind of wondering then how that fits into what Pakistan has been doing in terms of its par- Paris Agreement commitments. Um, and so, so it's quite confusing for me to see because we haven't tracked our climate change commitments. We haven't seen um, really uh, any kind of effort. And I know that COVID has come into play. And so for a lot of countries, they're, they're kind of... Um, it's kind of been an excuse for them to meet their targets, but also not because then they're just like, okay, we can't do anything about this right now. Um, and, and tying into what we've done about climate change up till now, I kind of want to ask you what a holistic kind of solution would look like then. Because uh, you're talking about, you know, we don't have enough community engagement and the fact that climate change is not the only issue, right? So we're, when we're looking at it in terms of how the dice is loaded to go back to that term Mm -hmm. we're talking about inequality we're talking about poverty we're talking about socioeconomic deprivation we're talking about weak governance systems as well so all of those things are loaded together and they can't be just in terms of let's plant more trees or let's do something about climate change it all has to go go together in a kind of like and i think that that's why so much of the global south has been saying we need debt relief in order to actually Absolutely. Go and handle climate change. We need debt relief. Absolutely. So, so what do you think about that? What are the implications of that? So, so I think um, again, uh, that's a, I would say that's a very accurate assessment of you know, especially your last point when it comes to you know the calls from global south towards mm-hmm. debt relief or uh, or debt for climate sort of swaps. Um, and I think what the major sort of issue has been, and that's something that's coming from the Pakistani government as well as you know we discussed at the top of you know our our discussion. Even though Pakistan is the fifth most vulnerable yeah. country uh, in terms of cli- its climate change, its vulnerability towards climate change, it also is a very low emitter, mm. right? So Pakistan currently is not, you know, 
causing the problems it's facing, the, the impact of climate change it's facing, Pakistan is not causing this. So even if Pakistan were to take undertake drives to uh, mitigate its, you know, its emissions, such as forestation or lowering emissions from the energy sector or lowering um, uh, emissions from the transportation sector, which, you know, obviously need to be done, it still will not be able to actually adapt to the impacts of climate change, such as, you know, reducing flooding or mm-hmm. actually sort of, you know, reducing sort of flash flooding and other weather events that are taking place. So what Pakistan needs is actually adaptation towards these impacts. And as of right now, mm-hmm. Pakistan faces a huge funding gap. Um, so, you know, the budget for the Ministry of Climate Change is is actually has increased over the past three years, which has been a very positive trend. But even then, uh, you know, Pakistan faces an annual short for about $10 billion in terms oh, wow. of, you know, okay. actually uh, take, undertaking projects and adaptive measures mm-hmm. to combat uh, its climate change impacts. So yeah. where is that $10 billion going to come from? Right. And that is where I think, you know, the the, south, the call towards, you know, um, debt relief efforts, um, you know, uh, debt swaps, um, impacts, you know, or other climate finance mechanisms need to come in because it has to be a holistic sort of global effort mm-hmm. to actually be able to address these issues. Um, one thing that Pakistan has so far not been good at and, you know, efforts need to be more on the front is actually tapping into the global finance market where, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there are opportunities available such as the Green Climate Fund and other opportunities where, you know, funding and financing can come in to help Pakistan adapt to um, its 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 needs. But then there is also the sort of, you know, a greater need for more holistic policy. So mm-hmm. as you pointed out, you know, the dice is loaded on you know, on multiple fronts. It's not just climate change. We cannot see climate change as an isolated yeah. um, issue that we have to address, you know, even if planting more trees is, is going to lower our emissions or, you know, is going to sort of lower the overall emissions of the country. That's not going, it's not a sustainable measure unless we also address some of the drivers mm-hmm. of deforestation that led to this issue. Similarly, when we talk about water scarcity, um, you know, you also look, have to look at how, you know, the farmers are currently actually, you know, practicing farming, but how water is being distributed between the different provinces as well. And what are some of the uh, measures that have been put in place to ensure equitable distribution of water? Because it's not just a case of water availability, but it's actually also a case of equitable distribution of water. Right. Right. right? So, I mean, and those are measures that require a more of a cost-cutting, cost-sectoral approach. The Ministry of Climate Change cannot operate in isolation. The government itself needs to sort of, you know, or you know, the government has to put a policy in place where um, different issues such as um, whether it comes to infrastructure development, uh, that needs to be sort of more climate proof, um, you know, economic uh, interventions that take place at a provincial or district level. We need to also incorporate um, the impact of climate change, but then any climate change policy would also need to impact um, or need to sort of incorporate uh, mm-hmm. the impact on the communities and how they need to be included in any decision making process when it comes to driving projects. Yeah, yeah. So I think so. The so holistic approach in, is to sort of answer your question, in a, you know, um, in a brief manner. Perhaps you know there are two two sides to it. One is that Pakistan can not do this alone. It really mm-hmm. requires um, help globally, and I think um, and some of it is well deserved given that Pakistan is doing yeah. a lot more uh, than it should, given its impacts or, or given its sort of contribution to global emissions. So and on one end, you know, it does need support globally mm-hmm. and it cannot do it alone. But then locally speaking, the policies that Pakistan has in place, some of the projects it's undertaking uh, also need to be more sort of, uh, I think, uh, need to be more inclusive uh, when it comes to communities. And I'm not saying inclusive where you know, all four provinces sit together, but it needs to sort of, include areas that are the worst hit so mm-hmm. you know include individuals from Malacca and include individuals or you know communities from Pakistan to communities from northern Sindh and the yeah. region who are the most impacted as of this point in time mm-hmm. um, and then only will we be able to see a situation arising where um, you know we may be able to avert armed conflict and maybe able mm-hmm. to avert uh, a more and growing disenchantment that's you know uh, we see from individuals and communities in these areas. Yeah, um, I remember reading um, straight after the Paris Agreement was signed that um, African states and uh, low low lying island states like Bangladesh had been like, please give us one point five degrees that we should only get it to one point five degrees. Um, anything 
more than that is a death sentence for us. And yet, um, then you had the oil producing states and the Western states being like, no, we have no interest in this. And and so what was the what was the you know balance between the two? What was the compromise? It was to say in the preamble that we will keep it to well below two degrees, which means nothing. It's not a binding, it's not a legally binding exactly. thing. Exactly. It's not a legally binding objective. Um, and I kind of like quibble, I kind of wonder about that and quibble about it with myself in terms of like knowing that it is so incredibly unfair that Pakistan is going to be so acutely affected when it has contributed very little to this whole issue. And then being like, but it's, that's just the <laughs> way the that's world is. Goes, yeah. And, um, what are we going to do to avert this? And also the fact that we have so many present issues currently that who is doing the forward thinking in terms of being like armed conflict will be the consequence of the consequence of climate change, right? So we're looking at something that is the result of the result of this and the the ways in which that will affect us, but also the ways in which that will affect us incredibly differently, as you already alluded to, where we're going to have angry young men in the streets who will ha- we will have left prospectless and who will then be, you know, right fodder for recruitment and also Absolutely. the fact that we may see that kind of conflict and insurgency within our own borders and it will have been over not, you know, the tribal or ideology that we thought it was. I mean, it, that, that would still be a factor, but it would be primarily because of climate change and the fact that you're leaving people to be incredibly nihilistic. Yep. Um, in terms of how how they handle all of this stuff, and I, I find that very interesting that link between climate change mm-hmm. and armed conflict, um, and, and I think that is something that um, is very hard for a developing country to do. It's very hard for a developing country which has so many other issues to deal with to deal with this. But but I think that I mean even in discussions that we've had about it, we're we're looking at it as climate change is still something that people are saying we need to prepare for but but i think that you've been one of the people who's always said it's here now yeah. and this is an issue that we have to deal with now right yeah so yeah so i think i think so that so that's the the major issue that's um facing pakistan and i think a lot of developing countries as well is number one i think looking at it as as as, as a, a cross cutting issue uh, so i think in the past um, governments and i would say to a certain extent um, that's some a trend that's been changing in pakistan as well is we've seen climate change as in, an issue in isolation which does not really feed into anything else it's something that you know it's, it's seen as an abstract issue not seen in its sort of real impact so even if you know pakistan still is one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change we are seeing impacts on it uh, of climate change on our sort of you know uh, people on an on a almost regular daily basis whether it's um abnormally high temperatures or mm. flooding or unseasonal um, rain uh, rains um, what have you but all of this is 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 sort of you know still considered in in isolation in terms of okay you know um you know this is climate change this is these are some of the projects the government is undertaking um, to mitigate the impacts, mm-hmm. not necessarily adapt, mm-hmm. and that's where things end. Uh, you know, the policy, or at least the agenda, still ranks very highly in the agenda of the government. But then, in terms of you know how it's being executed, we see that other ministries or other departments, which you know are responsible for more realistic policies, still do not see this as an important agenda item on their uh, you know planning mm-hmm. uh, sort of. Uh, things and then I think as you sort of alluded to as well um, with regards to uh, you know how uh, things are moving ahead with um, you know globally speaking what uh, some of the developed countries are doing so whether it's the US or the EU um, or China for that matter and their commitment towards supporting um, some of the countries that are at the forefront of climate mm-hmm. change whether it's yeah. Bangladesh or small island nations uh, in 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 the Pacific and Oceania, um, you know, which if, with a greater than one point five degrees rise, they're not going to be there mm-hmm. uh, in the next sort of two yeah, to three decades. Yeah. So, I think so. There's a huge disconnect between the two. Um, given that, I think I mean that's where a lot of my consternation has been coming in. Uh, mm-hmm. Has been there for a period of time where um, I don't think, um, even though there is there are commitments, there there is enough capital or there are enough resources out there. To save or to even sort of you know mitigate or turn back some of some right. of the right. impacts that are that we are seeing. So I think given the shortfall that we have, it's now a case of um, you know adapting mm-hmm. uh, towards climate change. It's not a case for mitigation anymore. It's mm-hmm. a case of adaptation. So you know the way we are 
seeing projects develop the way we are seeing, and it's, it's not just for Pakistan, even in countries such as Bangladesh, you know, climate change now has to be looked at as a, a, a risk that has to be kept at bay now. And the way to do that is to, you know, build more resilience, uh, build more resilience projects, uh, build more resilience locally, build more resilience regionally. Um, and that is done through not necessarily afforestation drives, but actually through uh, more sort of economic development, more sort of, you know, um, instead of focusing on uh, hubs of economic hubs, where which is what we are doing right now, you know, is focusing on two or three areas more localized development, more sort of community-led development as opposed to sort of having it, um, you know, be more uh, sort of centered and centralized, say, in certain regions within the country. Right, right, right. Okay, that's super interesting. Thank you so much for coming in. Um, and thank you to everyone who's tuned in at home. We hope that you will tune in for future episodes as well.